Good afternoon. I'd like to go ahead and take this time to take a little bit of a closer look to, or excuse me, take a little bit of a closer look uh, at Cornelius Vanderbilt, John D. Rockefeller, and Andrew Carnegie. On April 14, 1865, President Abraham Lincoln was assassinated by John Wilkes Booth while watching Our American Cousin at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. President Lincoln would be the last casualty of the Civil War. From then on up to the Woodrow Wilson administration and the Great War, or World War I, the United States would not be led by a politician, but instead, be led by an industrial titan. Cornelius Vanderbilt would gain his initial success in the shipping industry. As a young man, he began to build a, his shipping industry, and by the Civil War, he would be referred to as simply the Commodore. Surprisingly, at the eve of the Civil War, he decided to sell his shipping company and in turn invest his capital into the railroad industry. You see, Vanderbilt could see around the corner that many could not. Vanderbilt understood that it was not going to be the transportation of goods by water that was going to revolutionize the country, but it was going to be the transportation of goods by land that was really going to bring the United States into the 20th century. As in many cases, Vanderbilt's success would rely upon the success of other industrial titans, like John D. Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie. Although these industrial titans were, at the end of the day, cutthroat businessmen, they were also codependent upon each other. For example, Cornelius Vanderbilt's railroad company is going to rely heavily upon Carnegie Steel for steel rails. Vanderbilt is credited with the concept of industrial consolidation, which on a larger scale could surely create a monopoly. Industrial consolidation would simply be the purchasing of smaller companies in order to expand one owns company. John D. Rockefeller's initial success would come about due to the mass production of kerosene. Prior to the mass production of kerosene, illumination was considered to be a luxury in most parts of the United States because it was very inefficient to manufacture. Rockefeller would drill for crude oil, heat the crude oil, filter out the kerosene, and then sell the kerosene to consumers to use for illumination. Rockefeller's latter success would come from refining oil. He called his company Standard Oil because he said that it set the standard for all other companies to try to reach. Standard Oil would capitalize on the concepts of both vertical and horizontal integration. By being vertically integrated, Rockefeller controlled every step of the manufacturing process from drilling the oil to selling the manufactured product to the consumer. By being horizontally integrated, Rockefeller would buy out smaller oil refineries to extend the dominance of Standard Oil. Please note that it is much easier for a company to become horizontally integrated as opposed to become vertically integrated. Rockefeller is also noted for the articulation of the distribution process of his final products. By the turn of the century, the federal government began to pass business regulation that aimed to dissolve monopolies that already existed and place restraints to ensure that new monopolies could not be created. As it turns out, Rockefeller made more money with the federal government forcing him to break down standard oil, excuse me, break down standard oil than he had with standard oil in place. Because as new oil companies of that original 90% monopoly 
began to flourish like Standard Oil had decades before, Rockefeller made sure that he owned at least 51% of the shares of each new company. Andrew Carnegie's success would come from the mass production of steel. Prior to the invention of the Bessemer process, the production of steel was very costly and very inefficient. By utilizing the Bessemer converter, Andrew Carnegie was able to create the largest steel manufacturing plant in the United States, which would be known as the Great Edgar Thompson Steel Works. By 1890, approximately 3,000 tons of steel was produced in the United States per year. After 1890, excuse me, I, I should have said that. Uh, before 1890, approximately 3,000 tons of steel was produced in the United States per year. But after 1890, over 3,000 tons of steel was being produced in the United States per day. Carnegie devoted quite a bit of time learning the importance of capitalism, specialization, and innovation. Regarding capitalism, Carnegie argued that manufactured goods are initially seen as luxuries. And as the manufacturing process becomes more efficient and society adapts to the new technology, manufactured goods that were once considered to be luxuries would soon become necessities. Carnegie argued in favor of practicing specialization. He said, put all of your eggs in one basket and watch that basket. Carnegie argued that if you could be the most successful manufacturer of one single product, then you would be far more successful than if you tried to manufacture several different products at the same time. Regarding innovation, Carnegie felt that a Excuse me. Uh, Carnegie felt that a manufacturer constantly needed to update and use the most advanced machinery to make a product. The more advanced the machinery, the more efficient the process. If you can increase the efficiency, then you can increase the sale and the profit. Historians argue that in 1890, the leading industrial countries was one, Great Britain, two, Germany, and three, the United States. But by 1900, with a strong focus upon innovation, the United States had bypassed Great Britain and Germany and had become the industrial leader of the world. Carnegie also understood the importance of keeping a financial buffer between one and their company. By having a financial buffer in place, Carnegie could expand his companies while, or excuse me, expand his company while other companies were forced to close down or file for bankruptcy during economic crisis. I hope this has provided you with more information in regards to Cornelius Vanderbilt, John D. Rockefeller, and Andrew Carnegie. Uh, again, I highly recommend that you read chapter 17 because the questions on the quiz and the exam, uh, they may be a bit more specific. I hope you'll have a good day. Bye.